Shannon Bell, uh, got an MFA uh, from Poetry from the University of Nebraska's Low Residency Program in 2007. Uh, one of her poems, Red Riding Hood uh, to Grandmother, was nominated for the Indiana Review for inclusion of the Best New Poets Anthology in 2009. Uh, her poems have, been, uh, have appeared in such reviews as the Indiana Review, uh, Spoon River Poetry Review, Cream City Review, Tar River Poetry, and Calix, a Journal of Art and Literature for Women. Uh, her full-length poetry manuscript was a finalist for the Mae Swenson Award, and her chapbook, which is available tonight, please buy one, uh, is the Red Riding Hood Papers, and uh, it was published by Finishing Line Press in 2010. Uh, she teaches poetry, writing, and academic writing at Utah State University, where she is co-director of the Intermediate Academic Writing Program. Uh, please welcome Shannon Baum. So much to City Art and Sherry for her beautiful reading. That was that's a fantastic idea. Now I wish I could steal it. Before you took it. Um, it's an honor to be down here reading and to have all of you here and my friends who traveled all the way from Logan and my friends who traveled from Salt Lake, Rob, <laughs> and my family members as well. Even my little nephews are here. They're not so little anymore. They're kind of tall. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. Um, four poems that are not included in the book, and then the, the rest of the time I will read from the chat book, the Red Riding Hood papers. It's $14, so you can just come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is a villanelle, and if you're not familiar with what a villanelle is, it pivots on two rhymes. Um, and two refrain lines. Um, it is a 19 line poem, and I guess that's all you really need to know. It's called The Fall, um, about the fall of man, but also the fall of us individually. Myself, I guess, too. The Fall. You who just to feel your falling fell, unlocked your eyes to splendid shame. You who craved delicious hell fell to feel the sparkle in every salty cell. Ecstasy of knowing shimmers your brain. You who just to feel your falling fell into silence, aching tongue of a bell. You hunger to be wrung, to scream like rain. You who craved delicious hell yearn for serpents, the toxic tonics they sell, their promise to feed, to satiate pain. You who just to feel your falling fell into love, its incinerating spell, its sad hiss of ashes after the flame. You who crave delicious hell, the thrill of bitter bliss propels you to part your lips, taste, relish, blame. You who crave delicious hell, you who just to feel your falling fell. Um, this next one, that first one is a little bit also about alcoholism, which is a problem in my family. Um, and this is about when my mother was in the hospital um, with liver failure, and it's called Shocked. Think of scorching sun or screaming wind or the tick, tick, tick of wires against an unsuspecting pine over and over till the buzz of electricity nuzzles through. Then think of the blazing white lick of stripped wire on stripped wire, sparks, white slashes, misfires. Think of chewing on foil, tangy metal on metal, a dull ache in your skull as your eyes roll back. Then think, the nurse is talking about your mother who guzzled liquor for years till the nerve sheath dissolved in her brain. She hears rats scratch under cold hospital walls, sees ants pour out of cracks, Spanish program on TV, your mother interprets the intricate plot, your mother does not speak Spanish, and she helps with crossword puzzles, spells Mai Tai, M-M-B-A-X-R-W. Remember she told you that as a kid she thought L-M-N-O was one letter, Elemento. When you were a kid, your job was to switch the laundry and your mother warned, don't touch the washer and dryer at the same time. 
So you stood, wet socks lumped in your hands like dead rats, your parents' screams surging through the pipes above you. You held your breath, touched the cold, ungrounded machines at the same time, and your blood shrieked with a shock more terrible and delicious than licking the icy little nub of a battery, the dull purr and whiz of it on your tongue. Then, like now, you ignore every warning, because maybe like her, you never stop needing to harm yourself, just in case there's something more alive inside the squealing drill of pain. This is a newer poem. It's called Once More to the Lake, and I think it's a kind of a, a prequel to the narrative that goes on in my chat book. Um, and it also has to do with drinking and the disintegration of family. It's called Once More to the Lake, which is stolen from E.B. White, E.B. White's famous essay. Once More to the Lake for my sister. Didn't you just tell me you loved me? Didn't you just say you were sad about God? And just now, was that the sound of early morning, lake softly breathing? Now, at this hour, I can't bear to let go. Didn't we just dance on the beach with bare feet? Weren't we lovely? And wasn't my hair curled, my lips painted pink, lily of the valley pinned, sweet perfume soaking my hair? Wasn't that yesterday? And weren't we happy and weren't we strong, muscles flexing under tanned skin as we dove in, trout spinning their shimmering funnels around us? Weren't we a family? Weren't we? And wasn't our father charming that day on the lake, his blue hat flying off in the wind? And wasn't he marvelous, his enormous authority as he leaned from the truck window, Marlboro dangling from his mouth, his silent concentration as he snugged, inch by inch, our trailer into its narrow slot? And wasn't he wonderful in the mornings before he'd been drinking, how he hauled the jet skis into the lake, rainbows of gasoline glistening? We watched strapped in bright pink life jackets as he choked the engines, then throttled them until they screamed. I loved him, you know. This is our story. We wore green bikinis, cut off some thongs, white rimmed sunglasses even. We all drank rum in a cabin. And even then you knew you shouldn't marry that man, but you married him. Even then he slammed you down on the concrete and our parents never said a thing. Even then he forgot your birthday and you were only 16. And that was before you were pregnant, before I whispered abortion before we dove into the lake and witnessed our own distortion underwater, before we knew our father would not survive his life, the life we helped construct and destroy, and everyone keeps saying, it was not, it is not your fault, and it's not, but go back, go deeper. Had we not been so clever, had we not been so evil, had we not fought over the one blue cup, had we not bawled in the Mexican restaurant, if we went back, maybe we'd try to be better, learn to build engines, because having only daughters, he had to do this alone. Didn't we all love one another once on the lake, before we could look back and grieve, before cancer in the femur, before alcohol poisoning, before liver failure, before all these sad children, before everything collapsed, weren't we blessed, weren't we lovely? Once I wore perfumed flowers and a white cotton dress. Once we smiled for the camera near the lake, its cold turquoise drowsy and deep while we stood clinging. I'm asking you to take me, take me back once more to the lake. Okay, this one I chose because it seems to fit in with some of the themes of my Red Riding Hood book, and that is kind of shifting identities um, is part, partly what goes on in the book. Um, this is about, <clears throat> this is called New Bodies, and it, well, I'll just read it, and if it doesn't make sense, you can ask me later. <laughs> it's called New Bodies. Oh, become motion, oh, transcend, stand in the doorframe for one whole minute, 
Press the backs of your hands hard against the frame. When you walk forward, you sparkle, arms rising, you are an angel. Remember standing nearly naked in the cold filth of reservoir water. He pressed hard against you to keep warm. His teeth, his tongue on your throat, a sweet scraping, mud sucking your toes, sharp stench of carp, moss in your mouth, moon muffled by a rag of cloud. Secretly, you wanted him to bite harder, but you whispered, don't leave a mark. You tangled your fingers in his hair, mashed his mouth to your throat, don't leave a mark. Oh, slide through sensation. Someone says, it's such a rush. Oh, stand tall against a wall, wrap your fingers around your throat, hold your breath, choke, relish panic. Remember sludging through the green freeze of reservoir, emerging dripping on the shore, sand hard white, glittering, chill and ache, bright moon on goose flesh. Oh, he said when the light shimmered your throat. Oh, your mother gasped when you opened the front door. She raced to you, thought your throat was slit. The air drains from your lungs against the wall. You squeeze harder, your eyes bloom bloody like lilies. It's such a rush. You see red, red, red. Your mother presses a rag to your throat, but there's just a little blood. He licks your skin. A tingle blossoms in your abdomen, in the root below your navel. Your arms rise. You are an angel. Oh, become water. Become gold motion. Melting tongue. Oh, become color. OK, now I'm going to read from the Red Riding Hood papers. Um, this book is mostly about um, my sister's custody battle and an abusive relationship with her ex-husband. Um, it takes on the voice of different characters from the Red Riding Hood tale. The first one I'll read is um, Red Riding Hood in the Forest. I saw him curling, animal, around every bend, so I slunk and pressed my robes to rocks damp with mosses, wishing, oh, wishing to peel off my skin. Animal, he wants me around every bend. Once I gazed at him, my eyes dark and damp, I unlatched my cloak, pressed to him whole. At first he curled gentle, leaned me, bent me, then his teeth clenched my throat. I tasted gray snow. Then he curled, sucked me, bent and cracked my spine. I suck and sunk into a mind of damp and dark mosses. I changed my path. I burned my robe, but still around every bend I see him curling. So I've stopped washing my hair. Don't smear color on my lips. Learn to walk stiff with no swing in my hips. I clench my cloak tight cover my dark, secret places. I can't find a zipper to zip up this skin. Red Riding Hood's Wish. I'm no angel. I'm not dead. I live inside a little nest of words and I live inside your head. My story living and living. The day a wolf swallowed me whole. I'm a lesson. I'm the silly girl who didn't listen to her mother, talked to a stranger, and got her grandmother eaten. Wolf swallowed us both, and our twin bodies locked fast in the wet black grave. Sometimes we stay this way forever, rock together in the dark. Sometimes a woodsman hears me scream and comes racing to see the bulge of our limbs in Wolf's sleeping body. He slits Wolf's skin with scissors. We pop into the air, purple-faced, gulping, then fill his belly with cold stones and sew him up. When it happens this way, Wolf drowns in the well every time. We laugh and watch his eyes widen in the tomb of water. But listen, just once I want to be the girl who doesn't have to die, and I don't want to be saved. I don't want to watch Wolf drown, don't want to sew his hide into a rug or a coat, I don't want to tote his head on a stick through town. I don't want to watch little girls read my story and shake their heads as if they know, as if I'm the only one who travels forever through this brutal world alone. <clears throat> I 
The next one I'm going to read is called Still Waiting for the Judge to Sign the Protective Order. There's a poem called Waiting for the Judge to Sign the Protective Order, and it's just this horrible, I'm sure many of you have gone through it with divorce or custody or, you know, when there's some kind of abuse suspected and you can't get anything done. Um, and this was actually part, it was a nightmare that I had. I would have a series of nightmares, and this was one of them um, still waiting for the judge to sign the protective order. When I pass out later, my sister's voice goes with me, and I take us all to a hotel in the woods. I wear a black gown, and I've curled my hair. No, this isn't a hotel. This is a hospital, and the elevator keeps missing our floor. My sisters are going swimming. My mother's hair is golden, and she's very calm. She holds a phone in her hand, but I know it's really a secret kind of gun. My sister's ex won't know to look for us here. There's a party on the top floor, and I've witnessed a murder. Some poor woman's been shot. I've cut off my hair, played dolls with a child named Stella. All this on the way to the rich people's party on the top floor. <clears throat> I did laundry too, so much to do. Who was that woman I saw shot? Or did she fall? I'm an unreliable witness. What if I break down on the stand? I saw his face, but it was so fast. The elevator still won't stop, so we take the stairs, but they lead every which way like an Escher piece, and every door that blares a green exit light is another entrance to the stairs. <clears throat> this is called Grandmother's Bed about Red Riding Hood's grandmother's bed. <laughs> All afternoon, the bed dreamed it was a door. It felt the old woman's eye press and spy through its tiny, exquisite peephole. It relished the heavy pleasure of being opened, opened. It thrilled at the feeling of the child passing over its threshold, that strip of gold nailed tight in one place. It stood solid, refused to splinter, stood sturdy against the dreadful weather of winds and bitter drifts. It stood proud, adorned with fragrant wreaths of evergreen, smiling secretly when it felt the clean click of its latch snapping into place. It didn't flinch when the wicked or the desperate beat its face, demanding to get in. But when the bed woke from the dream, it was only a bed with its soft belly, and no way to slam shut against the fat wolf who wore the old woman's nightdress. No way to protect the quilts. He yanked them open, slipped inside. <clears throat> this is called joint custody. So one of the things, aside from we suspected sexual abuse, another thing that my, this ex, husband used to do is suffocate people and animals. This is called joint custody. Tonight I slowly spin the ginger root, telephone pinned between shoulder and ear, my sister's rich voice in my head. I strip the paper sack skin from the lemony heart. She tells me her ex is doing it again. No one to stop him now that she's left. The fragrance unfolds to my lips, and I can taste as I grate the cool ginger core. I mix the ginger with sherry, add garlic, the sting of white pepper. She tells how he used to laugh when the cats writhed in his hands, how he covered their mouths until their claws scrambled in the air. As I fold the gray bodies of shrimp into sherry, she reminds me how he would always do it to her, pinch her nose in the vice of one hand, pressed to seal her mouth with the other. The world was almost black, and now it's my niece. I dip one shrimp into the slimy beaten egg. My niece sucks hard against her father's salty palm. I smother another body in the ooze. The cat's green eyes pop wide. I drop the shrimp into sizzling oil, watch as each fetal curl blushes coral. Our fierce breath intertwines, hisses power in and out of the receiver. I'll just do two more. <clears throat> My sister 
had to move out, obviously, and she came and lived with my husband and I for a while. And we were so paranoid all the time um, that he was watching us. I mean, he used to video record my sister secretly, tape record everything. Um, and so I always thought that he was outside, like, and he was going to kill me. Like, I really believed that. And so this is called Safe House. I felt him crunch snow in December dark, felt the fry of crosshairs on my scalp through the tear in the curtains. I felt myself die every day they lived with me that winter. And though my sister and the baby had left him, paranoia squirmed little roots in my dreams till they burst into the pale purple of hyacinth, the frilled golden tongue of iris. My dead grandmother bloomed. That winter, she lived inside my brain like bluebells, like water, like the little stream beside her cabin that dripped its ache, its bone-cracking chill. I could see little wisps of her face, the pale strawberry birthmark on her thigh, the yards of silvery thread she spun into roses, then curtains, gardens spilling onto the carpet as the sun shone through, because our brains, those delicate angels, can spread the petals of their wings and lift. And the final one I'll read is Red Riding Hood shoots grandma's gun, and that's kind of where this picture comes from, Red Riding Hood holding a rifle on the cover. Red Riding Hood shoots grandma's gun. She snugs the smooth wood into her cheekbone, expels her last wisp of breath. Left hand cradles the long barrel. Now her body is a girl gun. Her hands, wood and metal. Her mouth is the barrel, black, deadly. Her finger, the trigger. She selects one leaf in the distance. It stutters dull to shine, shine to dull. The same shift you see in the eyes of a person fresh dead. Bright, watery eye of life, then iced over. She takes one deep breath, pushes it out. Steady, blam, blam. Words rip from her mouth and shred the left cheek of the leaf. Now it's lovelier, transformed to lace. Thank you.